Back in her apartment, Delilah ate enough cookies and milk to dissipate the disquiet she'd taken away from the house. Okay, she said, plan B. Setting up her laptop in her bed, Delilah got comfy. She checked her watch. She had about 45 minutes until she had to go to work. Plenty of time, she hoped. Next door, Mary was singing about mushrooms, but Delilah didn't care. She was on a mission. She figured she could find information about Ella on the internet. She started her web search with Ella doll. She was afraid that would be too, that it would be too general, but one of the millions of results gave her some information. Production of the Ella doll, Delilah discovered, was discontinued for undisclosed reasons. Jumping off from that fact, she tried to find out more about the doll, but she kept bumping into the same useless information or the text of the instruction booklet she'd already read. Running out of time, she began trying crazy searches. Haunted Ella doll, broken Ella doll, unique Ella doll, defective Ella doll, special Ella doll. These searches took her into a lot of pointless blogs that had nothing to do with the Ella doll. But one of the searches for special Ella doll led her to an online ad posted by a user named Phineas, who was trying to find one of the dolls. His ad referenced the special Ella doll, and said he was willing to pay a premium for the doll's energy, whatever that meant. Delilah checked her watch. She had to get to work. So much for her clever ideas. All they'd done was put her more on edge than she already was. Three more nights. Three more 1.35am awakenings. One night, Delilah had awakened certain that she was being watched. Every hair on her body had bristled like little antennae. Uh, an antennae? Antennae. Um, is that how you say antennae? That doesn't sound right to me. Little antennae telling her she was under scrutiny. In her mind's eye, she saw Ella's huge dark eyes boring into her soul. When she lunged for her light, she thought something touched her arm, but the light revealed she was alone. The next night, Delilah heard a rustling sound so faint it shouldn't even have been noticeable, but it still jointed, uh, it still jolted Delilah from sleep. When she opened her eyes, the sound got louder. It was coming from her closet as if someone was riffling through her clothes. Fumbling for her light, Delilah got up, strode to her closet door and flung it open. The closet contained nothing but her clothes and shoes. The next night, a rapping sound ro uh, woke up Delilah. In her dream, the rapping came from a woodpecker. Yo, I'm a woodpecker and I like to rap. <laughs> That's what I'm imagining in my head right now. Um, then she was, aw oh, sorry, when she was awake though, she realized the rapping was coming from the floor. Something was under the floorboards, tapping at the wood, as if trying to find a way out. Fighting hysteria, Delilah managed to get her light on. As soon as the room was lit up, the tapping stopped. Delilah was starting to get a little freaked out. She was so freaked out that she was now having trouble sleeping. After her shift, Delilah was so exhausted she'd fall into bed and go right to sleep. But then something would wake her at 1.35am. Some sound or sensation. Something just beyond the peri uh, periphery of Delilah's consciousness would intrude her into her sleep and drag her into wakefulness. Tonight, it was the sound of something in the wall between her apartment and Mary's. It was a scratching sound, wasn't it? Or was it a, a, a droning? Could it have been an alarm? No, Delilah didn't think so. She was pretty sure something was moving around in the wall. Delilah turned the light on and looked at her empty bedroom. She pulled her knees to her chest and tried to rein in her galloping heart. Here was the problem with all these nocturnal in intrusions. They all sounded like something trying to get to her, something sneaking up on her or beckoning to her in some way. Delilah was sure it was Ella. The doll was still nearby, she had to be. And she was functional, she just wasn't functional in a helpful way. Delilah had given this a lot of thought, a ton of thought. It was basically all she'd thought about for days. She'd decided that Ella was not at all pleased about being tossed out. Maybe being discarded activated some subroutine that turned on new functions in Ella, hidden functions. Maybe the person who made Ella had a sick sense of humour and thought it would be a fun trick to play on someone who had the audacity to throw his creation away, or maybe Ella malfunctioned. Whatever, 
The bottom line was that Ella was out to get Delilah. Delilah could think of no other explanation for what was happening. But what she could, uh, but what could she do about it? She stared at the thin barrier between her domain and Mary's. Mary. What if Mary had the doll? Mary's apartment looked out over the dumpsters, and she was home all day. What if she saw Delilah throw the doll away and she went out and got it? Delilah had to find out. Starting to get out of bed to go knock on Mary's door, Delilah stopped. It was the middle of the night. Pounding on someone's door in the middle of the night was a good way to start a confrontation. She didn't want a confrontation. She didn't want Mary to get defensive and hide Ella. No, she'd have to wait until morning and try to get Mary to give up Ella by playing nice. Mary was singing about penguins when Delilah got out of the shower at 7.30am. Dressing in her exercise clothes because she figured she'd need a run after speaking to Mary, Delilah went into the kitchen and warmed up the slice of peach pie she'd brought back from the diner the night before. She didn't know much about Mary, but she did know Mary liked pie, especially peach pie. Delilah left her apartment when Mary shifted into a verse about polar bears. As she knocked on Mary's flimsy front door, Mary belted out a line about an iceberg and then went silent. A second later, the door opened. Miss Delilah, what a nice surprise! <laughs> Mary grinned and reached out to grab Delilah. Delilah barely had time to move the pie to the side before Mary's big arms pulled her into a tight hug. Delilah's nose got buried in Mary's substantial shoulder. Mary smelled like sausages and sweat and lavender. Hi Mary, Delilah said when Mary released her. She followed Mary into the peaceful Japan-inspired oasis that was Mary's apartment. The first time Delilah had knocked on Mary's door to talk to her about the, si uh, the singing, Delilah had been expecting to find a cluttered apartment filled with knickknacks and books. Mary just looked like that kind of woman, about 5'8 of well-padded, middle-aged frump. Mary had permed grey hair, a lined face, and round tortoise se uh, shell glasses perched on a slightly upturned nose. She wore clothes in layers, vests uh, over shirts, over skirts, over dresses, usually in a mismatched colour hodgepodge. But Mary's apartment looked nothing like Mary. Please take off your shoes, Mary sang when Delilah forgot. Oh, right, sorry. Delilah held the pie in one hand while she balanced on one foot and then the other to pull off her running shoes. She placed the shoes on the little rack just inside the door. Then she bowed to Mary when Mary bowed to her. I bought you... Oh, never mind, this is Delilah. I bought you peach pie. Delilah held out the warm pie container. Oh, that's just the thing. The Mary grabbed the container, bowed to Delilah again, and glided into her pristine kitchen to get chopsticks. Delilah didn't know if Mary's decor and lifestyle came from a history with Japanese culture or whether Mary just fancied herself Japanese. She never asked because it felt rude to say, what's with the Japanese stuff? But Delilah had read enough to know she was standing on a tatami mat and that a bamboo screen hid the bedroom door and that she was being ushered to blue and grey zabutons set up around a chabodai on the far side of the living room. I don't know what the hell is happening. Uh, a gnarled bonsai in a blue container sat on the chabodai. Okay, other than the mat, the table and the Japanese pillows, the living room was bare. I think I understood like half of that. Uh, as Delilah sat on one of the grey cushions, she began questioning her idea that Mary had taken the doll. What would this strange woman want with a doll? It definitely didn't seem to suit her interior decor. But then, Delilah had never seen Mary's bedroom. What if that door hid a collection of dolls in frilly dresses? Mary placed a tea set on the chub... chub Stop saying that word! Chabudai. Uh, along with a plate of almond cookies, the pie container, and chopsticks. Having gone through the ritual before, Delilah let Mary pour the tea and offer her a cookie before she said anything. As Mary deftly uh, scooped up a peach slice with her chopsticks, Delilah said, I went to a cool garage sale the other day. <clears throat> uh, Mary placed the peach slice in her mouth, closed her eyes, 
uh, and chewed with what looked like sheer joy. When she finished chewing, she leaned toward Delilah and waved a chopstick in front of Delilah's face. Secondhand stuff brings secondhand energy. Old hands, bad hands, tainted with story. Mary sang. She waved her chopstick back and forth like a metronome, keeping time with her song's beat. You don't like secondhand things? Mary set down the chopsticks, grabbed the collar of her yellow, bra uh, yellow blouse with both hands, and pulled the collar from her skin to shake it several times. She sang, Penguins, penguins, pull in the cold. Polar bears scare away the old. Delilah frowned. She thought she'd figured out the secondhand song, but this new verse baffled her. Mary let go of her colour and picked up her chopsticks again. Hot flashes. She broke off a piece of crust and tweezed it between her chopsticks. Delilah sipped tea and asked herself what she was doing here. How was she going to get an answer out of Mary? She'd be better off knocking out the woman and searching her apartment. Delilah watched Mary eat. Even if she was capable of knocking someone out, which she wasn't, Delilah didn't think it would be a good idea to take on Mary. Mary was not only taller and bigger, she probably knew some kind of martial arts or something. <laughs> the past leaves stains, Mary said. What? No garage sales. No antique shops. No thrift stores. I don't want to open old doors, Mary intoned. I'm just going to do her voice like really annoying at the, at the top of my like... <laughs> the highest pitch I can do. Um, Delilah nodded. She was pretty sure she got that. If Mary didn't like old stuff because she thought old stuff had stains of the past, she wasn't likely to have pulled an old doll from a dumpster. Not unless she had done it and now she was just messing with Delilah. Delilah stared into Mary's eyes. Mary stopped eating pie and stared right back. Her eyes were pale green, streaked with swirls of yellow, kind of freaky. Delilah blinked and looked away. She stood. I need to go for a run, Delilah said. I need to finish my pie, Mary said. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, but I have to go. No sorry, no sorry, no sorry, just be, just be, just be, Mary said. Um, okay, uh, bye, Mary. <laughs> of course, Mary's farewell was more singing. <clears throat> bye bye, so long, ta ta, toodaloo until late, alligator. Delilah waved at Mary and fled the woman's apartment. On the tenth night of chilling 1.35am awakenings, Delilah locked her lamp onto the floor in a pure panic to turn it on. Instead, she'd broken it, and she was whimpering in fear by the time she got her flashlight from her nightstand drawer and flipped its switch. She was so sure the flashlight was going to reveal Ella at the side of her bed that she screamed as the light brightened the room, but nothing was there. Delilah, icy tendrils skittering all over her body, shot the flashlight beam all over the room. The light quivered as it scanned the darkness because Delilah's hand was shaking. With every new shift in the flashlight's direction, she absolutely expected the light to reveal Ella's face emerging out of the dim. Where had the doll gone? Ella had been here. Delilah was sure of it. What else could have made those soft little footfalls that snatched at Delilah from her sleep? Delilah had been dreaming. She was lying in a hammock alone. Then she'd heard footsteps, small and light, pattering closer and closer. She'd awakened when they reached her. Delilah kept shifting her flashlight's beam, and she listened. There, the soft steps. She aimed her light at the bedroom door. It was open. Had she left it open? She couldn't remember. She thought she'd closed it, but she couldn't be sure. She leaned toward the door and cocked her head, willing her ears to tell her what she was hearing. Were those footsteps in the living room? She heard a click. Was that her front door? Wanting to go look, while also not wanting to go look, Delilah chose to give in to inertia. She stayed right where she was, clutching her flashlight with one hand and grasping her sheets close to her body with the other. Still listening with every ounce of her being, she thought she'd heard a sound out in the hallway. Was that Mary's door opening and closing? Delilah hesitated for another few seconds, then she jumped out of bed, ran to the wall and turned on the light. She looked around her bedroom. Everything was normal. She turned, opened the bedroom door the rest of the way, and ran into the living room to turn on that light. Again, everything looked as it should have. Her apartment door was closed and bolted. She was alone. 
That was the problem, wasn't it? Delilah crossed her uh, to her love seat and pulled Harper's afghan around her shoulders. Uh, she sat sideways with her legs tucked under her. By the time Delilah had met Harper, she'd resigned herself to being alone. Sure, she was surrounded by foster kids, but they weren't family and they weren't friends either, until Harper. None of them loved her, and she didn't love them. None of her foster parents had loved her either. No one loved Delilah until Harper came along, and even then, Harper couldn't love her enough. After her parents died, Delilah didn't think she'd ever be loved the way her parents had loved her, until she met Richard at a Halloween party. She was a senior in high school. He was a sophomore in college. Their gazes locked over eyeball and blood punch, and they spent the rest of the night dancing. When Richard decided to take a sabbatical from college, he begged Delilah, the love of his life, to come along. She was just two weeks from turning 18, so they waited, and on her birthday, she said goodbye to Harper and the structure Happy Gerald. She headed off to Europe with Richard. It was January, so he took her to the Alps and taught her to ski. For a year and a half, they played all over Europe. Finally, Richard's dad dem uh, demanded that Richard come home and start working in the family business if he wasn't going to finish college. Richard proposed to Delilah. His parents and sister, with obvious reluctance, welcomed Delilah into the family. They had a fairy tale wedding. Delilah had felt like a princess. Then they moved into his parents' uh, guest house. From that point, all they had to do was stick to their plan. Richard would move up in the company. They'd have babies. They'd eventually get their own place. They were going to live happily ever after. Instead, Delilah was here, alone. Or not alone. She wasn't sure which was worse. Every day at 4.30pm, Mary left her apartment to go for her daily constitutional. Even if Mary hadn't explained this to Delilah, she would have known because Mary sang about it. Delilah had to get through two more work days and two more terrifying 1.35am wake-ups before she had a day off, so she was home at 4.30pm. Both of those nights, Delilah had listened to pitter-pat and rat-a-tat sounds that convinced her Ella was retreating to Mary's apartment after she, after she tormented Delilah. Delilah was convinced that Mary had Ella no matter what Mary said about old stains. So she decided she was going to break into Mary's apartment and look for the doll. This plan was only possible because working in a diner had some perks. You got to meet a large variety of people with a large variety of skills. One of Delilah's regulars was a private detective, Hank, and the night before, Delilah had asked him how hard it was to pick a lock. Depends on the lock, Hank had said, adjusting the vest of one of his three-piece suits he always wore. Single apartment door lock, she'd said. Deadbolt? Delilah had shaken her head. Mary didn't use her deadbolt. She sang a lot about thrust. Th thrust. <laughs> That's a Freudian slip-up. Uh, she sang a lot about trust and faith. Delilah had thought the detective would ask her why she wanted to know, but instead he just asked if any of the women in the place had a hairpin, and he'd taken one from Mrs. Jeffrey, an elderly woman who came in daily for rice pudding. He'd led Delilah to the door of the restaurant's storage room, and in five minutes he'd taught her how to pick a lock. Good thing Nate wasn't around. He wouldn't have liked knowing how easy it was to get into the supplies. So, thanks to Hank, it took Delilah only a minute to break into Mary's apartment. Once inside, she had to take another minute to get her breathing under control. Her heart felt like it was hopping around spastically like hot oil on a flat cooktop. Her legs felt weird as if they were going to run away while standing still. Adrenaline, she thought. Clearly, she wasn't cut out to be a spy. She was a mess, and all she had done was get inside the door. Well, why don't you get on with it so you can be done? She asked herself. She didn't think this was going to take long. Ella wasn't in the living room unless she was invisible. That left the kitchen cabinets, the bedroom, and the bathroom. Delilah forced herself to move. As she suspected, Mary's kitchen cabinets were sparsely filled, and neatly organised. Ella was not hiding among the stoneware or inside Mary's wok, nor was she in the refrigerator or the freezer. The bathroom was similarly near empty. 
It just had to be, sh uh, just to be sure, Delilah checked the toilet tank. Not only was it empty of hidden items, it was unusually clean. Delilah moved on to the bedroom. There, she met her first challenge. Mary's bedroom was filled with storage bins, stacks and stacks of black plastic storage bins that lined every wall and a pairing of two each made up Mary's nightstands. Other than the storage bins, all that Mary's bedroom held was a futon and a pillow, both lying on the floor. Delilah checked her watch. She had about 40 minutes before Mary would be back. She wanted to be gone in 30 or less to be safe, so she started opening bins. Delilah discovered a lot about Mary in the next 35 minutes. She learnt that Mary was at some point a teacher, that she was a widow, that she made or had once made beaded jewellery, that she loved musicals, that she had come from a family with three kids, and that she had once had a child of her own who had died in a fire. Oh god. <laughs> oh no. <coughs> Delilah figured, that gave, uh, Delilah figured that gave Mary the right to be a little weird. Mary had a laptop, which she apparently used to watch her movies, and she had an old manual typewriter. Mary typed up her songs. They filled seven of the 33 bins in the room. Delilah, moving so far she was dripping with sweat after the first 11 bins, looked in every bin. Ella was not in any of them. Giving up and about to head to the door, Delilah backtracked and carefully poked the futon on the pillow. They were the only places where, uh, left where Ella could be hiding. No Ella. Delilah looked around to be sure she'd restacked all the bins neatly. She hoped she'd put them in the right order. Even if she hadn't, she had to leave. Now, she'd gone well past her margin for safety. She barely made it back to her apartment in time. Right after she closed and bolted her door, she heard Mary's singing voice trilling. <clears throat> Blood flowing, heart pumping, healthy, happy zing. <laughs> Delilah leaned against her door, then slid to the floor. She was depleted and baffled. If Mary didn't have Ella, who did? And why wouldn't Ella leave her alone? On the 13th night of Delilah's sleep invasion of hell, Delilah heard an actual alarm at 1.35am. It was so loud that she dreamt she was being attacked by a huge bee. She was running from the bee when she opened her eyes and reached for the lamp she'd brought at a garage sale. The lamp was metal with LED bulbs. It wouldn't break. Delilah might though. The night before, Delilah had wondered, without much expectation at all, if she'd managed to live through the 12 nights of Ella. Maybe it would just stop, because Ella didn't know for sure why it had started. It could just stop. Right? Wrong. It wasn't stopping. In fact, now Delilah could still hear a buzzing in her ears, like a high-pitched whirring sound. Was she actually hearing that? Or was something wrong with her ears? What did uh, tinnitus sound like? She'd heard about tinnitus from one of the old men who congregated in the diner daily to grouse about the state of their bodies and the state of the world in general. He'd said his ears rang all the time. Delilah wasn't hearing a ringing. It was... it was nothing. It had stopped. Delilah turned over and put her face in her pillow. Why wouldn't Ella leave her alone? And where was she? If Delilah could destroy Ella, it would stop, but she couldn't destroy what she couldn't find. The day after she searched Mary's place, Delilah had started wondering whether one of her neighbours had gotten the doll out of the dumpster. She'd spent three hours knocking on every door in the building to ask if anyone had found Ella. Amazingly, only eight doors had gone unanswered. Everyone she spoke to had looked genuinely clueless about finding a doll. The next day and the next, she'd gotten to the rest of the building's inhabitants. She'd learnt the eighth unanswered door belonged to an empty unit. At 1.45am the next morning, she'd picked the lock to the empty apartment and checked for Ella there. Not, no doll. Delilah was beginning to have a problem that went beyond being awakened at 1.35am every night. The thing was that she wasn't just waking up every night at 1.35am, she was being terrorised every night at 1.35am. Every single night, some sound or smell or sensation stole into her sleep and wrestled her back into wakefulness, and now for the first time in her life she was having trouble sleeping at all. This problem had two prongs. First, she was having trouble getting to sleep at the start of her night. Instead of feeling the stress ooze out of her body when she hit the bed, as it always had in the past, now when she lay down, her stress multiplied exponentially. As soon as her head touched the pillow, she had a sense of impending doom. It felt like the heart 
uh, her heart was bouncing around in her chest. She began sweating and trembling. Her throat got tight. She alternately uh, felt frigid and then steaming hot. In spite of how fast her heart was beating, she couldn't catch her breath. 